Okay, so managerial accounting. So this first chapter is like, you know, there's a lot of terminology and, and sort of like concept introduction, but not a ton of accounting work. So, so hopefully the homework will be super easy. We're not even going to do a guided problem for this chapter. Okay, just straight into the homework and then, um, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Um, <clears throat> so let's just look at it. So what we did all last semester or longer ago, if you guys took it longer ago, is what's called financial accounting. Okay, this course is on managerial accounting. They're all accounting, but there's just some differences between them. So in financial accounting, we focused on the statement of cash flows, the balance sheet, the statement of stockholders equity, and the income statement. Okay, those are our main financial statements. And the whole point of those statements is to take financial information and put them in kind of a consistent format that can be understood by anybody with a little bit of training, right? So it's kind of like, how do we communicate what's happening in a business to outside users? The most common outside users, probably the most common outside user of, of, our, of, of my business's financial information is the internal revenue service, right? They want to know how much money I made so they know how much they can tax me. Um, but also people like lenders who are trying to decide whether or not to loan me money investors who are trying to decide whether or not to invest in my business and sometimes even like suppliers who are trying to decide whether or not to extend credit to me right uh, or do business with me uh, all of those sorts of things are, are what we're doing with financial accounting is preparing these statements so that external users can know information about our company managerial accounting is a little different because it's <clears throat> it's being created for internal users okay so we're not bound by all these rules of, um, of GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, the reason is we're not giving that to other people. Since it's our own internal information, we can sort of try to measure the things we think are important to us. This course will focus on, I, I think, a broad overview of the sorts of, of ways we measure managerial accounting information. But once you get into it, you start to develop your own reports, right? Because maybe what's an important measure for our business isn't an important measure for another business. And so we'll learn some of the more general type of reports people do. Um, okay, so, uh, and the other thing is, is we focus so much in financial accounting on objective measures, things that can be measured and try to minimize the amount of estimates and things like that, you know, we have to do them. Like when we say, what's the useful life of, of an asset, we have to make a guess. Um, whereas in managerial accounting, often we're trying to say, how do we account for these subjective things? Like how do we decide um, how much of the, the manager's salary should be allocated to each of the business operations here at the college? How do we decide how the president's salary is allocated as a cost to each of the business or each of the uh, the academic divisions. Um, should they do, do it equally? Does the president's pay get spread out in some other way? Do we consider it a different kind of expense? How do we deal with that? So uh, that's the sort of the differences between the two. All right. So <clears throat> again, there's our financial accounting statements. Uh, we worry about GAAP. They're used by external users. And then in managerial accounting, we're much more focused on directing our daily operations, planning for future operations, and developing long-term strategic thinking. Okay, uh, that's what we're doing. What I find is a lot of people who work in accounting sort of have a strong preference. Like some are like, I really like the orderliness of financial accounting. The fact that I'm like bound by GAAP and have to do it a certain way. Some people like that order. And others really like saying, working together with managers and saying, there's a problem to be solved here. Let's figure out how we can measure this in a way that we're getting meaningful data that we can then use to improve operations, right? So, so different people like different things. Um, I tend, I like the managerial side. I like, um, it's, it's often more um, collaborative, I guess, because you, because if, if you're the controller, I don't understand like what's happening in each of the business units in a business. So I have to go and talk with those managers and say, Hey, we've been measuring things this way, but does it really fit the way you guys do business and, and sitting down with them and, and, and building that plan? I enjoy that part of it. So, so here's this big picture that they put in there 
of the management process. Um, so if you think about this, this is kind of what we do in business all the time, okay? So we start with planning. There's strategic planning, which is like long-term overview, right? We're gonna make a strategic plan. And then there's operational planning. So like here at the college, I'm, I'm kind of an operational manager, okay? I'm over the business and computer divisions here at the college. And so I'm supposed to take the big strategy you know, the five-year plan that our president and, and uh, I'm on a committee that helps build those things too, but that, that we kind of put out this strategic plan. And then I'm supposed to say, how do we, as a business and computers division, how do we make this happen, right? So if we're talking about enrollment growth, instead of just thinking about, we want to grow by this much, I have to say, okay, what does that mean? Does it mean that we're going to make Instagram uh, videos and we're going to share them with high schools and and, and does it mean we're going to go do visits at high schools? Does it mean, you know, how are we going to recruit and get students here? So, so that's the difference between strategic, broad overview planning and operational planning. So then <clears throat> once we make our plan, my job as the manager is to direct, which means get people to do the plan and keep them on the plan. Does that make sense? And then... <clears throat> And then so that my directing will lead to actions, which will be how my people operate. That operating will lead to results, which we can then look at and say, is this good? Do we need to change what we're doing? Is there something else we should be doing? And in the middle of this whole feedback loop, so if you think about it, that's a feedback loop, right? This way. Then we also have the controlling feedback loop, which is like saying, we've made a plan. Are we sticking to the plan? and holding to it. Usually when we think of controlling, we're thinking of the financial side of a business. We make a budget, the controller at the college, his job is to ensure we stay on the budget. And when we have variances from it, to report those variances to management, okay? Um, that's what our controller does here at the college. Um, so that's kind of how a, a business operates. This is not a management theory course, or we'd go deeper into that, right? But it's an important overview as you're looking at, well, what's the role of the accounting side in it? All right, so thus far, most of the businesses we've been dealing with and the financial side have been either service-based, so they provide a service to people for pay, or they have been retail-based, meaning they buy products from a supplier and then sell the products to the customer. A lot of what we're going to be looking at in this class will be manufacturing businesses. A manufacturer doesn't, they buy raw materials from someone, they put it through some sort of manufacturing process and create a finished good, and then they sell the finished good. Often, uh, they often sell it wholesale to like a retailer, okay? Um, so this is, they just have this little example of a company called Legend Guitars and their little process. The customer places an order, then they have to get materials. So wood, guitar strings, whatever, bridges. Then they have different departments, a cutting department, an assembly department, and then that creates a finished guitar, okay? So what we have to do in managerial accounting, especially when we're dealing with um, manufacturing businesses, is we have to get our brain into this mode of thinking in like departments or divisions. Uh, so like, you know, what does this department do? They cut out the, the guitar and then this one's gonna assemble it together and maybe this one's gonna package it and sell for sale or whatever. Because our costs, as we're trying to track them, will flow through the business in that way, okay? So uh, there's a couple type of costs. The first we call the direct materials cost. Um, and the direct materials are what it sounds like. They're all the materials that go into the things we make, okay? There's also what are called indirect costs. Those are costs that are really hard to trace to a specific, they call them cost object, okay? The cost object is what you're making. So they use the production supervisor, right? So it's, it's one thing like if, if you're the person who's standing there on the production line, cutting out the wood in the guitar shape, I could say, hey, the, the cost of your salary goes directly to making these guitars, 
Okay. And then it goes down the production line and someone else is putting on glue and then putting it in a mold and, you know, assembling it. And I could say, I know that person's salary goes directly to the cost of guitar. So those are our direct, we call them direct labor costs. But then there's this weird indirect labor, like the supervisor, right? He walks around and makes sure everybody's doing their job, probably does all the reports and all that stuff. Well, who's, which, which guitar should the cost of his salary be applied to? That becomes muddier. Does that make sense? So what we do is there's, what you'll learn is this whole course, I feel like is about various schemes, various different ways to try to share costs, indirect costs across cost objects, because there's, because different people have thought up different ways to do it. Okay. And like I said, it's an issue here at the college. Um, you know, so for me, in our case, we're, I guess we're service-based, right? And so when I'm teaching you, it's clear that my time is a direct cost of the revenue we generate from your tuition and from the state paying state aid for your, for, for your attendance here. But when I'm acting as a division chair, where I'm supervising other employees and writing their evaluations and those sorts of things, well, then how does that apply? Especially because I supervise not only business division, but computer division and the FCR division and cosmetology. Like, how does, how do we apply that? Is it each of those divisions is one fourth of my division chair pay? Or do we say, well, there's more employees in, in, in there's different numbers of full-time employees in each one. So we divide it up saying, well, since they have since there's 20 employees across those divisions, this one has 10, so half of his salary will go, to, right? Like there's so many different ways you could try to do it. And the question is which one most accurately sort of describes how the costs are flowing through. And, and so that's the challenge of managerial accounting. So we have direct materials. That's the stuff we put into what we're making. We have direct labor. That's the labor we can track. Um, and then we have what we call factory overhead, or sometimes it's just called overhead, okay? And overhead is all of these indirect costs. So in their factory, they probably have to pay an electric bill to keep the factory at the right temperature and keep the lights on and keep the machines running, right? Again, how do we apply that electric bill to things? Uh, they have to pay insurance on the building. They have to pay for janitors and, and uh, maintenance staff. All of those sorts of things, those are the questions we're trying to solve. How do we apply those indirect costs? All right. So this is, again, just examples of direct materials cost, cost of wood, cost of electronic components in a television, silicone wafers, tires for an automobile. Those are all direct materials costs. Direct labor. Again, the wages of the employees who cut the guitars. Mechanics wages, repairing an automobile, machine operators wages, and a lot of manufacturing plants now using modern systems. It's super easy because what happens is as they work on a production line, a unit comes down the production line to be made and it has a unique barcode on it, right? And so the system, so the person working on it just scans that barcode and then they have their own unique barcode. They just scan their own barcode and the system says, okay, Whatever wages this person's earning right now as he does his work gets applied to this cost item. Then when they ship it down, they scan again and the next person does. So it makes it really easy to track those direct costs. Finally, overhead. So some examples of factory overhead or manufacturing overhead. Um, I've never seen this term used in the real world, factory burden, but it's the same idea, right? It's like all these costs that we can't directly put on anything. Heating and lighting for the factory, repairing and maintaining factory equipment, property taxes on the factory buildings, insurance, and depreciation expenses for all the equipment and stuff, right? Super hard to apply that to any one cost object. All right, a couple other terms. Sometimes some businesses will use the terms prime costs and conversion costs. Um, and what's weird about prime costs and conversion costs is there's this weird overlap in the middle, okay? So just recognize that this isn't something different. This is just another way that some people look at it, okay? So prime costs are the cost of the materials 
and the cost of putting those materials together. And then conversion costs are the costs of <laughs> putting the stuff together plus the overhead. So there's this weird overlap, which is why I think it's out of favor in some places. But just know these are just terms to learn. Don't get hung up on them right now, okay? Um, and then this is the way a lot of businesses think about things. So this is a, this is a good thing to, under, to try to understand. We have what we call product costs and period costs. And by period, we mean like the time period, okay? So product costs are direct materials, direct labor and factory overhead, all the costs of making whatever we're making in our manufacturing plant. And then our period costs are our selling expenses and our administrative expenses. And the reason we call them period costs is usually product costs, we won't claim those as an expense <clears throat> until we actually sell the product. And at that point, <clears throat> We'll, can't, we'll claim them as the expense cost of goods sold, okay? Um, whereas period costs, they get charged just on a monthly basis during that period. So it's possible with product costs, we could make the product this month and incur all of these costs, but it won't be an expense on our income statement until next month when we sell them and then we list it as a cost of goods sold. Um, as, as we're incurring these costs, we're just adding it to the value of our inventory. So the value of the assets growing, and then we sell it and it becomes a cost of goods sold. Whereas our selling expenses, we just go ahead as, and, and, and do those at the end of the month, say, well, how much did we pay our salespeople or whatever? So product costs versus period costs. And the reason they're differentiated is product costs get sort of rolled into the value of the asset inventory and then become cost goods sold we sell it versus period costs which don't get rolled into the value of the asset inventory just get claimed as an expense as they occur okay um so there's some examples of each i will not read them to you you can look at them i'll just i'll give you a moment okay is that enough of a moment all right we're good all right so uh, the difference between a balance sheet in a um, merchandising or retail type business and the balance sheet in a uh, manufacturing business, okay? So this is what we've kind of already seen. This is the current assets section. In a, in a merchandiser, they're going to have this one asset inventory. That's the stuff that they're planning to sell to people, right? I mean, that's what inventory is. It's a current asset. It's the stuff you're going to sell. But a manufacturing company is going to have three different inventory accounts. They're going to have a direct materials account. Then they're going to have a work in process account. And then they're going to have a finished goods account. Okay. So direct materials is stuff that you're going to turn into finished goods at some point. So for our guitar company, it's probably things like guitar strings, wood, um, bridges maybe, or you know, maybe, probably they buy bridges from another manufacturer of those bridges, or perhaps they, manu they make those too. We, I don't know, every, every company is a little different, right? Um, and so that would be their direct materials. Some companies, instead of calling that direct materials, call it raw materials. Same idea though, it's the stuff they use to build what they build, okay? Work in process is those direct materials that have had some labor applied to them, but are not yet finished goods, okay? So if you think about it, if there's a process where you turn the raw material or direct material into a finished good, anything that's partway through that process is work in process. And then finally finished goods, that stuff that we've completely put through our process and it's ready to be sold, but it hasn't been sold yet. It's sitting there probably. For me, it almost helps me to think of this in terms of like, like warehouses or something like that. Like there's a warehouse or maybe a room in our factory where all the direct materials are, right? So like if I'm a person who builds guitars, when I get the order to build 10 guitars, I would like walk over to that room and I would be like, hey, I need this much wood, this much guitar strings. Like I would ask them, I would maybe have a little form that said, here's all the things I need. In fact, that's what they do. It's, it's a material requisition form that says, here's the materials I need. And then the people in that room would go back on the shelves and like, give me the stuff I need. 
And in real life, the way that happens is they, they, they scan those things out of their inventory and then I scan them into my inventory. And now they, they move from direct materials into work in process. Then I go work on them in my area of the, of the factory. Um, and while I'm doing that, I've scanned my badge so that all of my time and, and labor I'm putting into it gets added into the value of those raw materials. So the raw materials plus my labor is now all part of the value of that work in process. And when I finish my part, maybe I pass it on to another person who does the fine tuning or whatever. I don't know what they do in a guitar factory. Um, and then finally, when that last person finishes their job, they probably take those 10 guitars and take them over to another room in the factory where they're stored until the truck picks them up and takes them out to the customer. And so when I finish scanning mine out and I go over and they scan it in, the computer system's actually going to move it from work in process to finished goods. Okay. And so at any given time, a, um, a manufacturing company is going to have all three of these inventory accounts in play. That's a major difference from what we've done in the past, okay? But I don't think it's one that's like insurmountably complex to consider, right? Um, and so in my mind, it just helps to actually think of it as a physical flow of, of materials moving from, from direct materials to work in process to finished goods. All right, the income statement for a retailer versus a manufacturing business. Um, let's see. So this isn't really an income. I mean, this is, so this is how they figure out their cost of goods sold. Okay. So they have inventory available for sale minus ending inventory gives them cost of goods sold. Okay. So with, with a retailer, if we have to calculate it, cause we don't have a good system for tracking it, we're going to in essence say, what was my beginning inventory Add my purchases. That tells me how much inventory I have to sell to people subtract out what I have at the end of the period. And that will tell me how much I sold during the period. Okay. Whereas with a manufacturer, I'm going to have, what was my inventory at the beginning? Plus what was the cost of the stuff I made during the period? That tells me how much I have available for sale. Subtract out what I have at the end. And that'll tell me what my cost of goods sold was. So it's not that different. It's just, instead of what did I buy from somebody? It's what did I make? So that's what the, this is what the income statement of a manufacturing business will look like. Again, I don't know why they're calling that an income statement. This is more of the cost of goods manufactured schedule, which is part of the income statement. Okay, let me move to that. So this is one different form we're gonna see that we haven't seen before, which is the statement of cost of goods manufactured, or sometimes it's called a schedule of cost of goods manufactured, um, which is just supposed to figure out what our total costs were on the stuff we made, okay? All right. So here's how you do it. And don't worry about like knowing it all right now. I'm just introducing you to the concept, okay? There'll be practice and chances to learn it. So, so we take what our materials inventory was at the beginning, we add our purchases. That tells us how much materials we had available for use. Then we take our materials inventory at the end of the period and subtract that. And that gives us the cost of our direct materials used. Then <clears throat> we can say our, this is the amount of our direct materials used plus the amount of direct labor costs plus the amount of factory overhead that we applied to the jobs gives us our total manufacturing costs. Then we can take our work in process inventory at the beginning, add our manufacturing costs, that told us our total manufacturing costs, take our work in process inventory at the end of the period, and that tells us our cost of goods manufactured, okay? Once you get used to this pattern, and this pattern will exist throughout the course, it's not hard, okay? It just, it takes a little bit of like practice with it, like anything else. Um, I told you about my granddaughter. My wife was, was, was braiding her hair and my wife was like, 
hadn't done it in a while because all of our girls are older now. And I said, do you miss braiding their hair? She says, I do, but I'm not very good at it. And my four-year-old granddaughter said, well, if it's okay, grandma, if you're not good at it, you just need more practice. And I was like, that's, that's deeper than it sounds, especially in a world right now where we have so many people struggling with what I call external locus of control. They feel powerless. They feel like the world's happening to them and they can't do anything about it. For a four-year-old to recognize when something's hard, it, all it means is I haven't done it enough, right? I just need to practice at it and I'll get better at it. I think that's, to me, I was like, I called her mom. I called my daughter, my granddaughter's mom was like, you're doing something right. Um, and so now when something's hard for me and I'm like, I hate this, this sucks. I suck at this. I'm like, no, I just need more practice. I just need to work on it some more and I'll get better at it. The only reason I'm better at accounting than you, because I'm not smarter than you guys, is because I've been doing it longer. I have more practice, right? So you got to start somewhere and things are hard when you start. Anybody ever learn, anybody ever play a musical instrument? Yeah, I see some, yes. Do you remember when you were a child? I used to play the, the tenor saxophone and I remember hours spent in this cold little back bathroom because it annoyed the family for me to practice out in front of everybody. So I'd go in this back room and it, it sucked. I, there were days when I cried because I didn't want to practice. It just, cause I hated it. Um, but to get to any level of skill, it took those hours of doing that, right? Unless you're my son, Tim, who can just sit down and play the piano. I don't get that, but it must be nice. All right. Not fair. Doesn't appreciate it. So there's the income statement. There's the sales. And you can see that this one has a lot of detail in its cost of goods sold, where they actually figure out cost of goods sold with finished goods inventory, cost of goods manufactured gives us the cost of finished goods available. Then they subtract out the inventory at the end to give them the cost of goods sold. A lot of them won't include all that detail, but that's how they figure it out still, okay? Um, gross profit, operating expenses, net income. Instead, a lot of them will have this statement of cost of goods manufactured included with it. And that's what we'll get some practice doing because that's kind of the new stuff for you guys. Again, here's the way manufacturing costs flow through a business. We have direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead flow into the manufacturing process. Anything that's unused goes back into our materials inventory. Whatever's finished is in work in process. Whatever, or I mean, unfinished, whatever's finished goes to finished goods sales. And then when we sell it, it becomes cost of goods sold. Again, I don't, I, it's, it's new, but it's not radically different from things we've done in the past. It's just a little bit different. Okay. All right. One other term or concept at the end of this chapter um, to remember. And, and this, to me, I, I like this because it starts to get to the heart of, of why managerial accounting is flexible because this is different for different types of business. So this term utilization rate, um, we use this when we have fixed assets and we're trying to um, understand how that fixed asset is being used uh, to serve customers or to serve it to, to, in some way, okay? So for my business, the one I sold, we, it was a storage business, right? And so we were asset heavy. We had buildings with, they were divided up into storage lockers, right? And then we would rent those storage lockers to people. Um, and so I had to figure out like, what was the utilization rate? Right? Did I have a bunch of them sitting there empty? And if so, what can I do about that? That gets back to that management process, right? Um, so typically a higher utilization rate is considered favorable, while a lower one's considered unfavorable. Um, and you'll see, this is pretty important, different businesses will have different names and computations used, but it's still the same concept. So here's an example, a hotel will do what's called an occupancy rate which is their number of guest nights. So the number of guests times the night, number of nights they stay, okay, guest nights, divided by available rooms. So they wanna figure out like, what's the utilization rate, right? you know? Cause if that, if those fixed assets, the buildings are sitting there empty, or if our fixed asset equipment is sitting there not being used, 
we have that issue here at the college, right? If you come in here like after 2 p.m., it's like a ghost town in these buildings. They're all busy in the mornings. They get busy again in the evenings because we have evening classes. But that like 2 to two to 5, 6 p.m., it just sits there empty. And we have management types that are asking us, why aren't you running classes during that time? Because we have these assets being unutilized. And I'm like, we run classes and nobody wants to take a 3 p.m. class. All right? Anybody here want to take a 3 p.m. class? No, it sucks. Uh, he's like, oh, I do. But most people don't, uh, not nobody. But um, anyway, and so again, we're, we're, this is an issue for a lot of businesses. Um, so in their case, they had 3,600 guest nights divided by 150 rooms times 30 days. So they're sitting at 80%, which is pretty good. A lot of times when I'm making projections, like for my storage business, I would make a prediction at like, or not a projection at like, what would revenue be at 50% occupancy? What would revenue be at 70% occupancy, 90% occupancy. That way I could sort of say like, <clears throat> what level of occupancy do I need to be making the sort of profits? Um, and you know, for me, if I can make a projection at 50% and still be making money, I like that, right? And so then I thought there's my, you know, and sometimes you'll even do like a break even occupancy rate. If I've got 48% of my storage is filled, then I'm covering all my expenses. So then anything above that I know is I'm making money. Okay, that's the idea of utilization or occupancy rates. And that's it. So that's the first chapter. That's an introduction. Like I said, you can get into the homework and get started. I believe on the schedule I have Monday as a homework day. Does that sound right? Okay, so but there won't be a, uh, a guided for this chapter. So we'll just get into that. We'll work on the homework Monday and uh, hopefully we can get it all done in class. You don't have to do any at home. Yes. Is it okay? Why'd you say uh-huh then? Okay, so no, this is homework. You have to do it on your own. So I didn't put in a homework day for this one. So we're gonna jump right into chapter 16 on Monday. My bad. Thank you for thank you for looking. Thank you for caring enough to contradict me in front of everybody. All right, no, 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 it's actually helpful because then people Otherwise, people would like not do it and then show up like Monday, like all excited to get their work done. Not excited, but you know what I mean. And, uh, and that wouldn't be time. So this is homework to do on your own um, between now and, and Monday. Um, that stinks, huh? Homework on the weekend? Uh, you could do it on Monday if you want. It's not due till midnight Monday. Okay. All right. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. And remember who you are. I don't know. Remember that you're loved, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and people like you. <laughs> I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and people tolerate me. There you go, yeah. More. No one's they haven't fired me yet. My parents haven't disowned me, kind of. All right. They haven't disowned me, they just don't talk to me anymore. All right.